So thank you everybody for coming and for being here with us. Um, happy Earth Week. Earth Day is Thursday, so we're, we're gearing up for that. I'm just going to go over a few things before we start and before I hand it off to Bill. Uh, my name is Karina. I'm the member communication specialist at Save the Sound. And there are just some tech things that we have to go over before we start. So the first one is, of course, we are recording. So if you would please stay on mute for the duration of the webinar, that way we can make sure that it's just Bill that shows up in uh, some in the recording. So we will send around the recording after for everybody to watch. We'll also send it out to people who registered that might not have been able to attend. So just keep yourself on mute the whole time. If you do have questions, uh, please feel free to throw them in the chat. So if you go across the bottom of your screen, there should be a little chat box icon that says chat under it. Feel free to type questions in there throughout the entire presentation. We will answer all of them at the end, uh, but don't lose your thoughts. So if, the, if something pops up when Bill says something, feel free to type a question into the chat whenever, doesn't matter what time, and we'll go through and read them all at the end. Uh, and that's about it. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Bill, our Long Island Soundkeeper. Uh, you may have seen him. He does a lot of these speaking events. He's also out on the water a lot, so he probably looks familiar. Uh, he was raised in Connecticut and earned a fish and wildlife biology uh, bachelor's of science degree at the University of Vermont and then a graduate certificate in fisheries management from Oregon State University. He served in Guatemala as a Peace Corps fisheries extensionist before moving to Alaska for 20 years, where he worked as a federal biologist, commercial fisherman, and, mu and municipal biologist. And in 2014, he directed the Kauai Invasive Species Committee with the University of Hawaii before returning to the Sound in 2017, uh, where he monitors for your water. So without further ado, I will kick it over to Bill. So um, today I'm, I'm here, essentially we're gonna be talking about uh, storm water and what it means for water quality as well as litter and but I we start all of our programs just showing the mission statement and uh, hopefully that bar will go away at the end let's see at the bottom here and it usually just goes off let me see if I can hide the well I'll just leave it alone for now so we're a regional group most of you probably know us we work in Connecticut and in um, uh, New York and basically, in a nutshell, what Save the Sound does is we're trying to restore the ecosystem productivity of the Long Island Sound and its watersheds. And we do that through a number of different techniques. Um, this is what we call our impact map, and it shows the different categories of work that we're involved in. Uh, we have our in-house attorneys that are doing a number of legal actions. A lot of them primarily are uh, Clean Water Act violations. Uh, we respond to pollution events such as spills. We have a good water monitoring program. We're in 40 bays and harbors, and we have some systematic bacteria sampling uh, down in Westchester County um, and, and part of Fairfield County. We do green infrastructure, which I'll talk a little bit about today in dealing with stormwater. Uh, land preservation is actually another technique for dealing with runoff and these spring rains, protecting floodplains. Um, fish passage is another big program. We have building fish ladders or removing dams to restore anatomous fish access to the Long Island Sound watershed. We have a, an excellent climate attorney and we're tracking a number of bills at the state legislature right now. And then again, dealing with litter on the beaches from the spring showers is our cleanup program. So I'm gonna play this. I am going to hide video panel. Help me out here. I think, I, I don't think we can see it. Oh, um, okay. Oh, it's good. very Great. faint, but it's not distracting at all. Okay. So this is essentially what we're talking about when we get the spring showers. Just massive amounts of flow coming down uh, in short order during these big events. And you can, this is actually a dam behind my house that was built in 1700 to power uh, an ironworks <clears throat> where they made nails and hammers and that sort of thing. And you can see a lot of this white foam that's generated. Uh, some of that's natural bio 
biofilm that gets stirred up, but there's also a number of houses that have really green lawns upstream and there's a number of horse farms. So there's definitely some nitrogen and nutrients getting stirred up, um, probably some phosphate as well. And that all comes down in the spring along with everything else and ends up in the sound. Now, this is a picture from a Maranek Harbor I took. And this is at the mouth of the Maranek River the day after a storm. And so you could see all of the floating bottles and, and there's a ball or something there. You could see all this algae that's mixed in from that was probably coating the rocks or maybe in some ponds upstream. And I imagine if you took a drink of this water, you'd probably encounter some fecal bacteria and you probably wouldn't be feeling very good the next day. So that's in a nutshell what we're dealing with. Um, so how do we deal with it? Well, first off, why do we even need the stormwater management specifically? Um, we focus a lot on nitrogen because that's one of the uh, factors that is really driving water quality issues in Long Island Sound. And then also all the trash that comes down through the stormwater systems and off the land is another issue because it breaks down into microplastics. Um, and then there's all kinds of other chemicals, tire ablation I'm gonna talk about, what that means, uh, the, your rooftop starting to, you know, some of the rain is fairly acidic. So you start getting paint that gets bleached and chips and sealants on stuff. So all of that, every time it rains, just wa slurry washes into our rivers and into the sound. Uh, fecal bacteria, that's why we get all these shellfish closures after a rain. Um, and then uh, I'm a fish biologist by training, so I always put a few things in here about what the stormwater does to fish. PAHs are your oil drippings, the petroleum products, that's one of the reactive components of it that you can't see. It's not that rainbow sheen. It's the stuff that's dropped a heavier molecule and it's dropping out and it gets into larval fish. And during the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill, they set up a fund and they did a lot of experiments and one PAH molecule from oil or gas can enter into a salmon egg and kill it and sterilize it. So you imagine all the fish runs with all those eggs out there and these, these drippings go in and they can sterilize the egg. And then heavy metals, we have a big legacy of heavy metals in Connecticut from the industrial revolution, uh, chromium, mercury, and those can really wreak havoc, especially on small fish when they're developing. And then of course, infrastructure, when you have flooding from these big surge events, you, um, you wear out your infrastructure. And the, you can see this picture over here, this van. This is a chronic area that's a problem in Stratford, Surf Avenue. I-95 is on top. So you know this water is eating away at the cement. This is supposed to be a road over here, decreasing the lifespan of that bridge. And this is brackish water. So this was a king tide. We all know sea levels coming up. And then there was a storm. So the floodwaters met a very high tide and created basically a river over the road that's brackish. So everyone who is driving through this, I refuse to do it, is going to have serious problems with their undercarriage in about three months, two to three months. You're going to have all kinds of rust and electrical problems. And why is it, why is it react like this? Back in colonial times, we didn't have these giant flooding events like this. Maybe if there was a snow or rain on ice event, you could see this, these types of, of flows. But now anytime it rains, we, we mimic that because we've paved over so much of Connecticut. And um, uh, this is from Connecticut Eco. So Yukon has a great uh, database with all kinds of information. And what this one is showing is an impervious cover layer. And what that, uh, shows is that any place the rain hits, it's not going to soak in. It's going to run off, hopefully into a field or a wetland to soak back into groundwater, or it's just going to hit the street, run down the street really fast, bringing all those pollutants in that I mentioned, and down the drain it goes. So that's how it's carried. So trash coming to Long Island Sound is typically from the stormwater pipes and combined sewer overflows, which combine sewage and storm water. So you've got um, you know, your cigarette butts and your nip bottles going down with raw sewage and that's being pumped into the, 
uh, the sound. And we're down to only six communities that have this. Um, we were up to, I believe it was 18 originally, Ann Strouch here on the, uh, uh, on the call. And DEEP has done a really good job through the Clean Water Fund to eliminate a lot of these, uh, these um, combined sewer overflows. We still have a ways to go, um, but hopefully by 2050, they're gone. This is an old way of getting rid of waste and hopefully around that mid-century, we don't have that anymore. Uh, New York Harbor is really dirty. So every time it, the tide comes in up the East River, it brings all kinds of stuff from New York Harbor and of course down the rivers. And then just people being, you know, people being people throwing beat wrappers on the beach or boaters throwing their beer cans overboard. Um, that's still going on. And then the nitrogen and bacteria is coming out of the wastewater treatment plants. That's primarily nitrogen. And again, the um, both New York and Connecticut have done a really good job reducing nitrogen um, when they don't have these combined systems. They have denitrification is much more common on plants. Uh, but we still have a lot of traditional septic tanks, which don't really remove that much nitrogen. Um, and cesspools, uh, same thing, especially on Long Island, those can be inundated. And then you have fertilizer coming off um, and from lawns and farms. And so just to give you some pictures of this, here's a cesspool that's collapsed. Basically, the pipe goes in and just fills up a hole and over time you hope it goes away seeps in the groundwater that i remember growing up and having one of those we were forced to remove it oh probably two and a half decades ago and put in a real treatment system um, down below here is uh, illegal or a broken sewer line these are stormwater pipes and sometimes there'll be illegal hookups or the or just do it by accident the contractor will put the toilet into a toilet line from a house into a pipe and it goes out the stormwater drain not to a wastewater treatment plant uh, over here on the right is a sanitary sewer overflow that's from rye from last year one we found that's a main trunk sewer line there and it had an old broken down manhole cover hidden in a pile of phragmites and we were getting really bad numbers from this creek and uh, we couldn't figure it out till we found this. So every time it rained, the pipes were so old that they would get rainwater and blow all the stuff out the top. And there's a nice shot from the Connecticut River Conservancy of uh, uh, combined sewer overflow. So that's raw sewage in the upper right-hand corner mixed with rainwater blasting into the Connecticut River watershed. And then uh, here's a picture of lawn fertilizer, nice green lawn. If you over fertilize, It'll go into groundwater or wash off if it rains soon after application. And then obviously long, the, you know, people don't always think about this, so maybe not obviously, but traffic produces a lot of nitrous, ox, nitrous oxides. And what happens that goes up in the air or gets put down on the pavement when it rains, that's another it's called atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. And it all goes down these grates. This is a stenciling project in West Haven from one of our collaborators, just to remind people that everything ends up in the sound. And so for most of you, this is old hat. With nitrogen is a problem because it creates this growth. It's like throwing fertilizer on your tomato plants. They get really leafy, um, but in the water, this algae and plankton, they use the oxygen at night to make sugars and during the dark phase of photosynthesis. And when there's lots of them around, they go through a boom and bust cycle. When they die, all this stuff settles down to the bottom. And then all the microbes in the benthic community on the bottom eat them and use, utilize oxygen for, for processing that, that dead material. So what ends up happening, you suck all the oxygen out. And if the bunker get chased in there in the Manhattan, they die. Uh, we had lots of fish kills last year because it was a dry, hot summer and that Long Island Sound was just like a simmering cooking kettle and there's still nitrogen being brought in, less rainfall and it got really concentrated. Um, it also kills off the, mar the, the salt marshes because the plants get over fertilized, they have a lot of leaf material, the root structure isn't as robust because of that and so big chunks of the marsh are falling off and that gets replaced by open water. So you lose all that filtration of the marshland. We lost about 70% of our marshes from their original status. 
So, and what, how does it affect us? Um, we get all this, this overflow from stormwater, brings nitrogen and bacteria, and you can see the, the bloom here. There's all kinds of algae. There's, this is macroalgae or seaweed. You get big blooms of that that wash up on the beach and rot, and people don't want to go to the beach. Um, if there's sewage in the water, you can't go swimming because you might get you know, fecal bacteria in your mouth and get sick. Um, and then obviously there's lots of closures of shellfish that are associated with these storm events. And it's a $30 million industry just in, in, in Long Island Sound um, and just in Connecticut. So it's a big deal. Every time the shell fishing gets closed down, that's lost days of work, that's lost product being moved to market. So it's pretty expensive endeavor to still be dealing with this in this day and age. Um, and then toxic algae is another issue, which I'll talk about now. So this background picture was from uh, Milton Harbor in New York. It looked like antifreeze in the water. This is in 2019. Um, we didn't end up identifying this because we didn't, we weren't set up yet, but our new lab is gonna be able to take water samples from harmful algal blooms and figure out what species they are. I have a colleague up in Casco Bay in Maine and they've seen two new species last year of harmful algal blooms show up uh, in Maine. So as things are warming up, new species are moving in. As, as the stormwater keeps putting all these nutrients into the system, it's just creating a nice stew for these things to thrive. Um, when I was a marine mammal strander in Alaska, uh, there was a period of time where we had what's called an unusual mortality event. And uh, lots of gray whales were dying. They were washing up on Kodiak, on my coastline on the outer Yakutat Bay where I was. And so we had to cut the whales open and get the stomach, stomachs out um, and tie them up or take samples of the stomach fluid and send them down to a lab in California because they were hypothesizing that doemic acid was what was killing them. So that was a, that's a toxic component of a harmful algal bloom that was, they were, they were in jet, these whales were filter feeding and they got overloaded with the toxin causing them to beach and die. Um, so it's becoming a big, a big issue right here is a classic picture of a dog swimming through one of these. If that dog ingests too much of it, they can get, it can become toxic as well. Um, and we're seeing increases in this. So this is a, a monitoring program in New England. And you can see New York's having a worse time of it out on Long Island because they have so many of these septic systems. They're creating uh, more intense algal blooms. Now these are mostly, these are all fresh water, right? We're just starting to see issues that down here with marine harmful algal blooms. Um, there have been some rust tides and things in the past that have killed off some clams, but we're also seeing around Oyster Bay, there's been some reoccurring harmful algal blooms, but you, you just, you know, this is something that we're gonna have to be prepared for, which is one of the reasons we really need to clean up what's going on in the watershed so we're not feeding these things, then we can keep them at a minimal level. I'm gonna switch over now to uh, marine debris. And this is our, our fearless president, Kurt Johnson with a lifelong friend, Peter Davis. Uh, Peter Davis, um, he, he works for New Haven um, and he cleans up after every rainstorm about a 25 block area. And he's been doing it for about 30, I think over 30 years. And he gets four full garbage bags every time it rains from this one section of stream and <clears throat> this lake. So it's a constant problem. We've all seen it. So how do we deal with it? So this is a picture of a, a bioswale in New Haven. And they're putting in a few hundred of these. And we need hundreds and hundreds of these put in all the urban environments. And what these do is when it rains and all the water is coming down the curbside here, carrying cigarette butts and whatever else, there's a curb cut here and it slopes. So all that water drains into here. It drops down in the groundwater. It's engineered for that. During the growing season, a lot of that nitrogen and other nutrient pollution will be uptake by the growth of these plants. And then all the trash gets caught right along this area. So it makes it easier for people to, to clean it up. Uh, to maintain it. And, you know, 
the more people that get involved in this, the more people start thinking about stormwater, start thinking about the watershed. And a lot of areas, there aren't, there aren't many places to do gardening. Um, if you have a highly populated area, there's a lot more concrete. So these projects introduce folks to planting and water and water quality, and then they're picking up everybody else's trash. So they start thinking about, well, where did this come from? And so when there's policy uh, issues that are coming up, they can support those locally, like bag bans and those types of things. And uh, I don't know how old everyone is on this, on this talk, but for those of us who grew up in the 70s, we remember when the, the eco movement really took off and everybody was into recycling and the organic gardening movement started and uh, save the wetlands. You know, there was a little protest in my neighborhood to save a little wetland with all the little kids. Um, you know, I made a career out of it. So having an experience like this, cleaning up a beach early on can really, could really see the next generation. If we look at the climate youth action that's occurring now, it seems like it's much bigger, much more sophisticated. Uh, these kids are just really well educated and they see a dire situation with all these environmental issues. So I think that uh, we're gonna see some big societal changes here over the next couple of decades. Another thing we can do is um, catch the stuff in the rivers. So this is a band along litter, litter trap. It floats in the river. I believe these were invented in, in um, Australia. They're very expensive. They're a few hundred thousand dollars and you have to maintain them, obviously. Um, there's a couple down in the Potomac area around DC with another water keeper down there. That's one of my colleagues. He runs two of these. But you can see here to the right, this is Bruce Brook between Bridgeport and Stratford. And I've been working with Joe Gresco trying to find a time when we can come in here and clean this out. Um, but there's high bacteria counts. Our colleagues at Harbor Watch test this water as well as the uh, Stratford Conservation um, Commission. And they're concerned about people waiting in this, this river because there's so much fecal bacteria. But you can imagine all this stuff getting blown out during the, um, during the rains. So, but this is everywhere, right? I mean, I'm going through all the different, um, co I'm basically patrolling the whole coastline and I'm GPSing every single stormwater pipe. Now this is also done by the Bureau of Aquaculture. They walk the entire Connecticut coastline probably once every 10 years, they get to all of it and they GPS every pipe. So all these pipes are blowing trash out um, every time it rains. And we're starting to get information from Long Island as well. N Nassau County sent us a map that has, I don't know, maybe 1500 to 2000 culverts on it for their stormwater system. So these are all point places. And now these are, you know, having trash come out of your pipe is actually a Clean Water Act violation. Some places actually have um, total maximum daily limits of how much trash you're allowed to have. They get negotiated, but we don't know that. So what's going on now is we have one of our, our, our good backers down in Stanford. I brought a guy over. Um, he's actually a crane operator in the city, but he's very interested in this issue. So he just built this yesterday. He sent me a picture and I have permission to use this. Um, it's a blue crab trap with some poultry netting on the back. These PVC pipes are going to float. It's open here, but it slopes up. So fish can come and go through this. Um, and then there's a absorbo pad here that'll catch any oils that are coming off the road. And he's just going to put this in front of a pipe. They have a little lagoon in front of their house. And every time it rains, it fills up with bottles and plastic bags and stuff. And they have to go and pick it out of the reeds. It's a real hassle for them. It's basically a dump in their front yard. And then the, at the end of this little lagoon, there's another pipe and it goes right to a, a beach in Long Island Sound. And so it floods back out there. So we're going to capture all this stuff and start uh, enumerating how much this one little small municipal stormwater system is producing at this particular place. Um, and when it gets to the sound, well, then there's really no other option but to, if you can't stop it on the streets, if you can't stop it once it gets to the river and it ends up on the beaches, 
we run the international coastal cleanup. We coordinate that, Save the Sound does for uh, the Connecticut coastline. There's other groups that do it for the New York portions. Um, but, and last year we had a, a we, we had virtual cleanup, so we didn't have as much participation, but this is more of a typical year in 2019. So I'll show you this data. We had over 2,500 people picking up trash at 72 different events. Uh, and we break down that trash into different types of uh, items. So as policy changes, if we get, there, there's some um, uh, bills that are uh, uh, up at the uh, legislature right now, such as balloon releases, polystyrene. Last year, there was the bag ban. We should start seeing a change in the characteristics of what shows up beach cast as these laws take effect. Um, I, <clears throat> I wanted to bring up this new one. This is tire ablation. And what that means for those who don't know is basically tire wear, tires wearing out. So imagine going down the, the highways and your tire bits, little microscopic bit, bits are coming off all the time. We're just laying that stuff down. Um, and where does it go? Well, on the left-hand side, this is pretty typical. I go under all the bridges in my patrol boat under I-95 for navigable waters. Any place my boat can get up, I'll go under. And almost all of these, except for the Yankee Doodle Bridge that's being redone in uh, Norwalk, where it was negotiated to intercept a bunch of the runoff coming off of the, the bridge and redirect it away from basically straight piping down into the river. Um, most of the I-95 bridges, the stormwater goes off the road with all that tire ablation, all that brake dust, all the dripping oil and antifreeze and goes right into our rivers. And just last December, there was a paper that came out from the West Coast in Portland, Seattle, Northwest area. They were having this, this mystery where these fish were, these, this is an adult coho salmon Beautiful fish, great condition. I would say this is a female full of eggs going up an urban watershed to find a place to spawn, just starting to turn that classic salmon red. This is a healthy fish, just died. And they tested thousands of chemicals and they finally figured out it was 6-PPD quinone, which is an additive to tires, which makes them more elastic and they last longer that way. Imagine a brittle tire, like a farm tire, you know, running down the highway, you're just going to be losing chunks all the time. But this chemical is extremely toxic to fish. And the, the, the thought is, is when the, the salmon or any anatomous fish, the counterpart for us would be blueback herring, shad, alewives, American eels, lamprey. These are sturgeon. These are all fish that go out in the salt water can breathe in salt water, then they have to change to get into fresh water. And they do that because your blood cells are salty. So in salt water, the saltier water wants to get into your cells. So you have to keep that out. But when you get the fresh water, the salt in your cells wants to get out into the fresh water. It's osmosis, it wants to be balanced. So during that switch from fresh to salt or salt to fresh, these fish are very vulnerable. So if you have a big rain event and there's all this toxic chemicals coming in, you know, this may be one of the reasons we're seeing some really depressed uh, populations of these anatomous fish, aside from just habitat loss. Um, I'm getting close to the end here. So the solutions are big. I mean, this is non-point pollution, right? So we're all responsible. We all have to be part of this. Um, but there are some big tools coming to help municipalities. In particular, this is a bill number 6441. Um, <clears throat> I believe it's in the House right now, waiting to be heard or voted on. Um, and it's an act concerning climate change adaptation. So the Governor's Council on Climate Change came up with a bunch of recommendations, and a lot of these ended up in this bill. And uh, it does things with the Green Bank. It, it helps municipalities with their board structure about what they can work on. Um, there's a conveyance fee for real estate. There's a bunch of stuff. But what I'm going to focus on, which is my charge, is establishing stormwater authorities statewide. Right now, we have a pilot program that only allowed four towns to form stormwater authorities, and only one of them did it, New London. 
and they were successful. They're generating uh, one $1.2 million a year. Um, the fee for a, a small house, you know, with a thousand square feet of impervious surface, maybe a roof and a little driveway, it's $2 and 50 cents a month. So they get billed seven dollars and fifty cents a quarter. If you're two thousand square feet of impervious surface, it's fifteen dollars a quarter, so five bucks a month. All that money went to hire a couple of people that focus on stormwater, that can look at grant opportunities, that can go and G GPS and survey the system, look for places of improvement, maybe apply for three nineteen or other grants that can do some of this green infrastructure. And they actually they bought a pump. They had terrible flooding pro pro programs. I mean problems downtown. But you know, if you have an ongoing stream of revenue that you can count on year up, year in year out, it's easier to bond. It's easier to get a bank loan to go buy this pump to alleviate that flooding, which isn't a green solution, but it keeps the businesses from being damaged every time there's a high tide and a rain, big storm. So what this would do, if the town so chooses, they can apply this fee to the impervious surface, which is causing these flashy stormwater events. Um, and start dealing with the problem statewide. So we're, we're fairly hopeful. It's not as easy as it sounds passing it. Um, there's some more single use bans, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, we should get back to the circular economy. Some people think this is a novel idea. It's really not. I mean, any farm uh, that, let's go back 200 years ago. I mean, everything was used and reused. Um, if you go to the old Coca-Cola bottling plant model from the earlier part of the 1900s, right in the middle, you'd have the bottling plant with distribution spokes going out to a wheel and people would drink the Coca-Cola, the bottles would go back to the bottling plant, they'd fill them up again, they'd go back out, they'd get drunk again, back and forth until the bottle broke on the line because it had been too worn out. Now, when I was in the Peace Corps, they were still doing that. Those bottles were too expensive. You're not manufacturing down there. And you'd buy these bottles that you could see they'd been down the roller line probably 30, 40 times. Um, so that, you know, this is getting at the root of the problem. We need to change how we deal with all this waste. We need to get rid of all this single use stuff. If we're going to go to composting, so if it does get away from us, flies out of the back of my pickup truck, it ends up in a storm drain, it just breaks up and goes away. Um, there's some positive... Uh, discussions or new technology looking at potentially wood cellulose for things like plastic bags um, that would really break down. The, the plastic biodegradable bags that a lot of people are stumping are 30-year-old technology. It's only 40 percent, 30 to 40 percent cornstarch and all those those natural polymers are holding together polymers made from um, natural gas or other petroleum products. And so they just break everything down into small bits that you don't see. It's not really uh, compostable. So I'm just gonna wrap up here with um, all this, why we wanna keep all this stuff out of the ocean. Um, many of you have probably seen this picture. This is a Laysan albatross chick. And um, this is a, a live chick. Obviously, that's yeah, a dead one. I think this might be Midway Island. And I worked on Kauai for three years and doing a lot of conservation work. So I got invited up to this rookery. There's a few of these albatross um, sites. They were restored. Um, and this is an adult, and that's its chick. And they're completely, they don't care about humans at all. They, they evolved without predators on these remote Pacific islands. And so these birds will drop off. There's a cliff here you can't see. And they'll go way out to sea, right out into the garbage patch that we talk, that you, everyone's heard about. And they'll pick up bits and things. They're looking for fish. A lot of them are looking for squid. And they'll come back and they'll feed whatever they have. They'll regurgitate it to their, their kid. They'll hang out for a while and leave. And so um, these things are just amazing. It's just heartbreaking to see this because after a while, we stayed there for a couple hours. All the adults got up and formed a circle around my kid and my wife, and they're clacking and dancing and doing this amazing, almost like a ceremony. And then, then they got bored and they went back. A couple took off. Um, so we just, you know, it's not just about us. All our waste is affecting lots of other things that are out there. So fairly general discussion. 
Um, but if there's any questions from folks, uh, feel free to ask. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Bill. Yeah, nothing, nothing came through in the chat, but if anybody has any questions at this point, um, feel free to type them into the chat or honestly, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. This is a pretty small group, so don't be shy. Feel free to like turn on your camera, turn on your microphone and ask any questions or say hello. Um, we'd love to hear from you. But... Hey, uh, Bill and Karina, this is Mike Bonomo. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hey, yeah. Mike, how's it going? Oh, I'm good, Bill, how you doing? Good. good. Yeah, on the um, stormwater fee that you were, ta you were talking about. Yeah. Um, to the average citizen, it's going to sound like another tax. Yeah. Right? So the, immediately there's going to be that reaction. But such great things can come from it. And you, you talked about, you talked about it a little bit. You talked more about the fee structure. Have you given thought to when this gets presented to the legislature and then to citizens to either vote on it or have to support it to give case studies. So if, if we, if you had, or there were some case studies that said, here's what this tax can do, here's how it can benefit your neighborhood, then perhaps it would not be met with the hostility that lots of taxes I, are met with. I think we're, yeah, we're and you know, that. I'm um, if anybody I'm in contact with the Republican question, leadership on this, and, I will stop and um, um, you know, that's the first that, reaction: the storm tax or the rain tax. The last time we tried to do I'm this, looking right, at yeah, um, eighteen, I think. Um, I do have a question. We we had an article. There was an article in the Stanford Advocate calling it the. I think it, it was the storm. You're tax. breaking up a little. And bit. this happens in a lot of other places when these are. Um, uh, use but talking to Chris Stone, I mean, who runs the uh, well, I do have a program question. For um, Keith, or one of the main folks, over not, there. I put it in the um, chat. he said that typically how this happens goes first off, you don't have to call it a tax because it's a fee, it's like you flush the toilet, you're using the piping system that's going to a treatment I think they place, said they're putting their and you pay a sewer fee. I, you're definitely you use up the pipes that bring yourself. water so to your you house for question, drinking. You, you, you have you. to pay a water fee. You, you know, if you're going to have all this polluted water coming off your property and do another pipe system, especially, or if we're having you should be paying for maintenance of those pipes. Right now, it's somehow cobbled more. together with general fund and money and public works, and it's not sure a lot of times it gets ignored because it's underground. So, it's a fee for something you're already using, you're getting for free right now and all the environmental damage. But what Chris Stone said is there's always resistance in the beginning. Uh, yeah, that was me. Uh, I, I a couple put that will form, Sorry just like that. New London's the first one in Connecticut. And then they just start oh, to pop up it. because other towns see all the projects oh, that are being oh, funded, uh, oh, all the matching weird. money uh, generated for well, other we can, grants okay. uh, that uh, can bring in uh Maybe this will work now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Oh. Creating jobs, fixing the existing system, clean buying a vac truck just for your you know catchment system. That's a big deal too. Um, then more people start doing it. I mean, Oklahoma has a bunch of these. Western Kentucky University does an annual survey of how many stormwater authorities or stormwater utilities exist in this in the country, and that's oh probably over two thousand now. And they're going up by leaps and bounds because it is really one of the only ways to ge generate revenue specifically to deal with these. Um, right now at the legislature, you know, we're, we're the details that we have to work out, which are good to do now, um, are you know, hospitals have an agreement that they are not be not to be charged any any increase in fees by the state till later this decade. Um, airports like Sikorsky or Bradley have huge stormwater. They already have stormwater management plans that are pretty strict um, and they have to deal with that. So they're looking to be carved out. And then the biggest resistance we were getting was from farmers. And, you know, down in Pennsylvania, there was some, some towns were even charging farmers for tilled land, which, you know, that's bordering on, that's, just, that's, that's real overreach. I mean, do we want to see the farmer just, you know, have a $3,500 bill 
or they just can't make the taxes and they just throw up their hands and say, you know what, I'm going to put 50 houses on my farm and retire. I mean, that's pretty much what's been happening in Connecticut. So we do want to protect the, the open space land, the land trust, the farms, the forested lands. So those are not those are going to be exempted from the fee in the over enabling legislation. That's the intent. Now, if you have a farmhouse that's right on the road and your roof drains into the road and into a system, you'll probably get a small fee for that. But if your barn is set back and that's a huge amount of square footage, which is why they're worried about getting these big fees um, and that runs into your back field or into a little wetland, then you know, then you wouldn't, then you'd be exempted as well. So we're working on that language right now. Um, it's not easy. You're right, Mike. And the real battle is going to happen when we have to go town to town and say, folks, you really, this is a really good idea. Um, it'll really help clean the pollution coming from your particular municipality. Yeah, no, great, you know, great points. Um, I think, selling it to the towns, it's going to be important to have those before and after pictures. If, if, if you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh that, yeah. That's so compelling then. Yeah, you go from murky water to clean water, or you can show trash reduction, right. um, you know, or you can just show, you know, bacteria drops, you know, or nutrient drops. I mean, there's more work going on with EPA and USGS now doing groundwater modeling of nitrogen. And um, they've got in-stream nutrient gauges on the Connecticut and they're figuring out the transit times of all this stuff. So yeah, um, and that's another project. We still need to talk about that, Mike, the, the alternative treatment systems, because um, there's a bill, um, we should talk maybe later this week. There's a bill about um, increasing the ATS uh, systems limit in Connecticut. Anybody else? Um, I just said that I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of new to learning about um like uh like water and, and like storm management. So I was wondering if you had any recommended readings for newbies. <laughs> yes. So um, there is a group called um, uh, Nemo. Um, which is, uh, it's for, it's uh, um, educating municipalities on their uh, requirements for what's called MS4, which is a general permit for certain towns that have um, over 12% impervious surface because at 12% and below that, you have a lot less water quality problems. When you go above 12%, all the way up to completely paved, you have, there's a strong correlation to water quality issues. And so if you just Google Connecticut Nemo, they have a series of uh, YouTube videos that are phenomenal. If you wanna know about uh, stormwater authorities or utilities, which I was discussing, discussing they have uh, Randy Collins, who's uh, the head guy on stormwater for the, Connecticut Council of Municipalities, CCM. He's very, thank you. He's very knowledgeable. They have the folks who actually form the stormwater utility in New London, actual practitioners go through how they did it, how they communicated it. They, they show you all the numbers. Um, so go to Nemo if you want to just get started on stormwater. Um, and you will find an incredible amount of information. So, and then also you can type in stormwater Connecticut deep. So between Yukon and deep, um, you're gonna find all you need to know. And I put the link um, in the chat to Nemo that Bill was talking about. So you can find it in the chat. I can also make sure that it's in the follow-up email that we send around to everybody. So I will do that as well. But thank you all for coming. Um, I will not take any more of your time. If you think of any questions later, feel free. I'm gonna send out a follow-up email to everybody who attended and registered. Feel free to respond to that if you have any other questions you'd like answered. Uh, I'm gonna put two more links in the chat. The first one is to our Stay Engaged page. It has all of our upcoming events. Uh, like I said earlier, it is Earth Week. I think this week we had 13 events going on. So there's still a lot up there. Feel free to take a look. 
uh, and see what you want to, to join us for. If anything, we hope to see you with them. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to put up is just the link to our donate page. Um, you guys help make all of this work possible. So if you enjoyed this presentation and you want to support our work, uh, please consider making a donation. We can't do it without you guys. So thank you again for coming and we'll end here. All right. Thanks, everybody.